The county of Wiltshire gets three to 400 large and complex crop circle patterns every year. I have camped up there quite a bit, and it's a beautiful place with a lot of history. I've seen three with my own eyes. The first one appeared during the day by a main road in clear view of everyone traveling east. It was the end of a long driveway where I was living, and we walked up there and went to have a close look. The field was full of thick stems of oats that were all pushed down into perfect circles spiraling inward. There was a main large circle, 40 feet across and snaking lines about a meter wide that turned into smaller circles. It was hard to see how any human could have done this. The stalks were actually woven together in patterns and they were bent over, but none were snapped or uprooted. It was unbelievable. The next one I saw was while a friend and I were on a road trip. We had pulled into a rest stop and were taking a walk to stretch our legs when we noticed an enormous crop circle with perfect triangles 150 feet across in the field below. The third one I saw was five years ago. I was sitting on the raised roots of an old wild cherry tree looking at the familiar view of flax fields, which have a nice blue hue when they are flowering. I looked down just for a second or two, and when I looked back at the field, a perfect circle had formed out of nowhere. It was baffling. Two years later, I read about it in the local newspaper. Apparently, there were three perfect circles in total, each 150 feet across. They were in a perfect equilateral triangle a mile apart with our town in the middle. A specialist team of researchers came down and took soil and plant samples from within the circles, and they did find anomalies, whatever that means. Crop circles are often extremely beautiful to look at. Orbs of light have been seen frequently in conjunction with crop circles, as if they are the ones making the patterns as they fly around low above the crops. Much like the Bigfoot phenomenon, though, crop circles tend to be dismissed. Some explain them as hoaxes or works of art, but as someone who has seen them with my own eyes, as someone who has witnessed one appear right in front of me, I can tell you a human could not possibly accomplish such a feat. Hey y'all, welcome to the podcast. I have got a little bit of work that I'm trying to do. So I'm in here extra early this morning, trying to record some new stuff. I've been putting up the archives because I'm busy to make sure that I keep the stories flowing. But this is a new podcast, new stories that have never been done. And the podcast probably over the next week or two, will probably be a little shorter. I'll just do a couple of stories for each podcast and get something out. Hope that's good enough for everybody. Sure appreciate you joining me on this. Two good stories coming up. All right, here we go. Okay, this is a Bigfoot story. This email actually came to me, I think in five or six separate emails. It's like people will (laughs) write a few paragraphs and they'll say the rest of it to come later. And I don't really like those. I wish you guys would just hang on to them and write the whole story, send it in one email and, uh, you know, proofread it, make sure you got all your memories right, think on it a day or two and then send it. But in an attempt to try to get almost every single email that I get on the podcast, I'm doing this story. Rebecca, my editor, she's she's doing a great job. She uh, was able to piece this together out of the, it was supposed to be in six parts, but I only got five. And she, <laughs> okay, so I've been accused of changing stories. I know where that comes from and that's fine. I don't change stories, but I'm going to tell you up front, I am changing this one because there was a part of this where this guy had, shall we say, enchanted moments with the Bigfoot ladies. Let's put it that way. So that's not in this story. But the rest of it was pretty good. So I'm trying to do the best I can and get all these done. So let's get into the story. The the man's name is Skeeter. S-K-E-E-T-E-R. Skeeter. 
To skip through a lifetime of stories and important events a long time ago on a camping trip near Yosemite Valley, I befriended a Bigfoot that I came to know as Stella. I had set up my camp and started fishing in a stream nearby when we ran into each other. Neither one of us seemed to know what to think of the other, and we stared at each other for a while, waiting for one of us to make the first move. When she concluded that I wasn't going to cause her any problems, she not only tolerated me, but seemed interested in communicating. That's when I learned that Sasquatch communicate telepathically and can control the emotions of nearby humans. The alarm I initially felt was inexplicably replaced with an overwhelming sense of calm, and I happily continued fishing. I lured in four trout and offered two of them to her and then watched as she stood there knee-deep in water and gorged on them raw. It was something to behold, and when I went back to my small campfire to cook up my remaining catch, she joined me and watched. I cooked the fish and we engaged in a sort of mental discourse and I was amazed at how easily this telepathy business worked. She heard me think it and laughed gutturally. I looked at the grin on her face, the blocked teeth with the exception of the rather large canines, which obviously could do considerable damage if called upon. Her arms and her entire build were powerful, and she heard my thoughts and seemed amused at them. Are there more of you? I asked. I learned that she was part of a clan and that there were 23 of them in a 20-square-mile area. As our mental conversation went on, it occurred to me just how superior the Sasquatch are to humans, not just physically, but because of their exceptional power to project mental images and thoughts on us. I should have been scared straight, but there we sat like two old friends. It was very calm. Night came and the forest woke up with the sound of wood knocks and yells. And Stella screamed back, basically telling the others to shut up that she was fine and I was an okay dude. I was growing tired and sensing that I needed to sleep. Stella reassured me that I would be safe that night and even offered to keep my fire going for me. The next morning came a big surprise. There was a second Bigfoot in camp, a larger, more powerful-looking male with the hairy physique of a bodybuilder underneath all the fur. It was Stella's brother, I soon learned that. I called him William. He pronounced his name for me, but I couldn't understand it beyond being a guttural mess in my ears. But just because their voice boxes are not constructed like ours does not make them any less of a being. We need to keep that in mind as we encounter more of them and other species here and off-world and consider that we may not be at the top of the heap as we'd like to think. Thank God William was friendly, or at least friendly enough. He had brought a quarter of a venison, and he and Stella were partaking. I was offered some, and I fried it up in the skillet. And like Stella, William seemed to sense that I had a good heart. In getting to know them, they shared their history with me, and I learned that they were one-quarter human. If my memory serves me, a Native American man had relations with their Sasquatch grandmother, Her son, a half-human, had children with a female Sasquatch. Their children were Stella and William. The two of them were wild as cats get, make no mistake, but they had a slight tolerance for humans. To make a long story short, they knew me to be an all-right guy, and they also knew about the Smith & Wesson 460 Magnum revolver that I carried for close encounters with bears. Seeing my gun, William shared a story with me about an encounter they recently had with the Mexican cartel growing illegal weed in the area only a mile or so away. One of their Sasquatch cousins had been wounded by an AK and died shortly thereafter. The two brothers of the slain were posted to watch while the plan was formulated amongst the clan to take out the offenders that evening. The task was relatively easily accomplished by stealth. Even at 8 feet tall and 600 pounds, their ability to travel unseen in the woods is unparalleled, matched with their ability to communicate telepathically and control the emotions of humans within a certain range, they were truly a force to be reckoned with. 
They snuck up on two members of the cartel and ripped their heads off their bodies and then caught up with several other members of the cartel and they broke their arms. It certainly sent a message and the remainder of the cartel cleared out of the area in a matter of minutes. Well, my supplies were becoming limited and is it near time for me to end my camping trip and leave? Stella gradually released her hold on my mind and my emotions, but left me with the knowledge that the other Sasquatch in the clan would leave me alone unless given a good reason not to. So before I left, I gave my fishing pole to Stella and taught her and William how to tie flies or use bugs that they could find. I also left a good supply of fishing lines so that in a pinch they could use the branches of trees as fishing poles. I gave them all the fish I had caught, and I bid my farewell. I began walking, and a mile later, when I was close to my truck, Stella's hold on my mind was completely released, and a flood of emotions washed over me like a tidal wave. I felt panic and anxiety and wonder and dumbfounded shock all at once. If I had encountered anyone else in the clan, I'm sure my camping trip would have ended with wild horror. But by what could only have been sheer luck, I ran into Stella and William. In the months and years that followed my experience, I came to develop a great fear and appreciation for the Sasquatch. I feel intense gratitude for having had such a life-altering experience, and I'm filled with a bittersweet sadness that I might never encounter Stella and William again. Okay, that's the end of that email. I don't have any comments on that. It was an interesting story. And if they're not just terrible, terrible, terribly written that we can't make any heads or tails out of them, we put them on here. And this is one of them. So I hope you all enjoyed that. Thanks for joining me. I certainly do appreciate it. Maybe you could hit the thumbs up button or even subscribe if you thought this podcast was interesting. I've got over 700 of them up on YouTube. And I think about 500 up on the podcast app. If you want to listen on a podcast app like Apple or Spotify or one of the others, just do a search for What If It's True Podcast. It'll be right there at the top. Uses a lot less data and a lot less battery on your phone if you listen that way. But as of right now, still a free country and you can listen to whatever you want to. So I don't really care, but I thought I'd throw that out there. Appreciate you listening, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Thanks.